of the course. So really, the course has four components. The MATLAB, which we've kind of started with, is one component. Statistics is one. When I say statistics, I mean applied, like how to apply it to real data. Uh, linear algebra and nonlinear algebraic systems, and then finally differential equations. So this is the start of the second or first part of the course, depending on how you want to um, think of it. I'm starting at the beginning because I don't know who has any of this background and so all the, comp all the stuff I'm teaching I assume you don't know anything about. So if you know something about probability of how to class and stats, you know, I'm not sure what to tell you. It might be, not, it might be moving a little slow for you, but I, make, I don't want to presume any knowledge from about any of these topics from most of anyone. Now when I teach differential equations, I'm going to assume you're taking the differential equations course, but other than that, I'm not going to make any assumptions. Okay, <coughs> so I'm going to... Um, Introduce the idea of probability. Um, and my experience with probability is it can be a difficult thing for people to latch on to because we're used to, at least I'm used to thinking deterministically, right? You do something, you get an answer. You do it again, you get the same answer. That's the way I like to think of the world, but that's not the way the world <laughs> works. And I know I'm disappointed. Um, and so the idea of probability, you have to kind of think differently um, about things from what you probably used to, to thinking about them. So I'm going to introduce the idea of, of uh, probability and then things which you've probably heard of permutations and combinations, just different ways of calculating how many possibilities for different scenarios they are. And then you can use those results to calculate the probability of a certain event occurring or something along these lines. Okay? So it's all meant to be background. Yeah? No. Um, see, that's the thing. You can ask, but you shall not receive. Okay. Um. <laughs> I'm kidding. You shall receive. It's on. But I've been told a lot to be quiet, but I've never been told to speak louder. All right. So, so. what's going on here? Whoa. volume is way high. This one, right? Yeah, I've got it like, I mean, I'm here and it's like. No, I just accidentally hit this button a second ago. Uh, right before that, I think I hit mode accidentally. But I'm not, not hearing anything. Try again. Nothing. And it's loud already. Um, can I see this? Better. talking and maybe. All right, so here's the conclusion. He made a very reasonable request. I'm not able to uh, accommodate him at this stage. He's going to mess around with it. At some point, this might get like hyper loud. We'll see, okay? But for now, you got to deal with what I can offer you. All right, so I'll try to speak up to the best of my ability. All right. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention is the website. We've, we've wrestled control from ECS of the website. And so we'll start posting stuff on there, I would guess, this weekend or earlier. And that'll include everything I've sent you plus everything for the future that you need. Okay? All right. So, um, I thought I would put this um, slide here because this helps me, or at least is kind of the way I think about statistics and applied statistics. So, um, it, you know, statistics is a little more general than this, but this is one way to view it to try to wrap your mind around what we're going to be talking about. So, um, Obviously, when we're, when we're talking about data and doing statistical analysis of data, we're talking about performing experiments, collecting data, doing the analysis. And so the way you can think of measurements is um, that these are variables that you measure, and they're, su they're subject to some kind of random variation. So in other words, if you do the exact same experiment under the exact same conditions, you will not get the same answer, typically. Okay? 
and there's some inherent variability in the, in the measurements that you perform. And you cannot predict, in, in a deterministic sense, this, this randomness, okay? So obviously when you, like if you use Excel and you solve an equation, you'll get the same answer every time, okay? Because that's deterministic. But that's not the way the real world works. And so we need a different set of tools to, to, to handle this kind of randomness or variability, okay? So we're going to be dealing with things called random variables, okay? They're usually capitalized. Um, like capital X would be a random variable. That means this is a variable that's, that has random variations. And we have to, and the idea of statistics is how do you, how do you characterize those random variations? So in other words, you, I can't tell you what the value of X is going to be for any particular experiment, but I can tell you the probability of X having a certain value, okay? Um, and so that's kind of how it works, okay? So all the, so like I said, alluded to, the chance of a variable having particular value is governed by something I've introduced today, which is probability theory. And you guys have all seen what I call the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution or the bell-shaped curve, right? You've seen this? Um, and so that's going to play a big part in the analysis that we do because that's people use that a lot. So one way to think about doing experiments is that you're, the sa you're taking samples from an, a distribution, right? So I assume that you've seen Some oh, sorry. I've not given up on the mic. Continue to use it because it's being recorded, is what I've been told. But you're just not hearing it. Okay. All right. So let's say you have a variable x here, and then we have something here, which I'm going to have to explain, but I'm going to try to define. But certainly you've seen, I assume, this kind of curve, which is the best I can do to draw a normal bell-shaped curve. Okay. And so you c if you do an experiment for x, so this is some measure of how probable this particular value is. Just call it p for now, OK? So in other words, the most probable thing is you'll get that, but it, you might get any value. So if you do an experiment, you can think of experiments as you're extracting samples from this distribution, right? Sometimes you might get this and this. Occasionally, you might get a value way over here. It's not very likely, but you might, right? And so then the question is, um, how do you analyze your data so first thing you'll do is assume it comes from a distribution like this because you don't actually know. But if you want to actually reconstruct this distribution, you need an infinite number of samples. So how do you take a small, usually small number of samples and do statistical analysis um, knowing or assuming it came from a distribution like this, okay? So you can think of sampling or experiments as kind of sampling from this distribution um, and then trying to characterize this distribution from the samples that you have available, which is usually a small number, you know, 10 or something like that. All right. Okay, now here's things that I know you know, so we don't have to spend much time on this. So if I do some, um, I want to move about. If I do some experiments, and I, let's say I'm going to do some measurements, I'm measuring some quantity called X here. And so the subscript that you see here, I'm not blocking it, hope. The subscript is the experiment I'm performing. So this is all the same variable, okay? And I'm just measuring it multiple times in multiple experiments. First experiment, second experiment, doing little n experiments, okay? And then I, I assume you've seen things like this, right? The range means what's the minimum value of x that you get in any experiment. Subtract that from the maximum value of x you get in any experiment. Um, the median, which we don't use much, but they do for houses for whatever reason. That's the middle value. When you, so if you order them according to their magnitude, you just find the value in the middle. That's called the median. It's not the same as the mean, okay? We like things like this, right? I know you've seen this. This is actually called the sample mean, which I'll make clear in a minute. So what do we do here? Take all the samples, add them up, right, and divide by the number of samples. That's, that's the mean or average. You've seen that. Um, I tend to use this variance more than the standard deviation, but I assume you've seen the standard deviation, right, somewhere. So what do we do? First of all, we have to know the mean of the data. So we take each sample, subtract the mean from it, square it, okay? sum up all those squared terms, divide by 1 over n minus 1, where n is the number of samples, take the square root, that thing's called the standard deviation, okay? Um, I prefer, and the book usually uses the variance, variance is nothing but s squared. So if I say variance, I mean this. If I say standard deviation, I mean the square root of that, okay? So it's either s squared or s, we usually s squared, okay? So hopefully we know already the mean is a, it represents, a, it's a measure of the average value, right? It's not the only measure, because the median is another measure of the average value, but we prefer the mean typically. 
And the variance is some measure of the variability of the data. If something has a small variance, then there's not much variability between the different experiments. Otherwise, it has a large variance. So here is a little example. I just made this data. This is not real data. I just made it up to prove a point. So if you have these um, seven samples, I believe, right? And you calculate the mean, that's quite easy to do. Of course, I, I always do these actual calculations in MATLAB, but I just show them as if I calculate them. But so I sum up all the x values here. I divide by 1 over n, which is 7. And if you do that, you'll see the, uh, the mean is 1. I made it so, all right? And then if you do the standard deviation, just so I'm sure you can see this already, but um, so to count, am I doing the standard deviation or the variance? Okay, the variance. So this will be 1 over 7 minus 1, because n minus 1, there's 7 samples. Then you'll have the sum of, do I, what index do I use, I or J? J? To seven. Everyone's comfortable with this indexing. I'm sure you've seen this before, right? Sums over indexes and things like this is not foreign to you, okay. Um, so then I take the first value, blah, 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 what's that, 0.25. I subtract off one, I square it. I take the next value, I think it's 0 0.5, subtract off one, square it. That's, I mean, that's how you calculate. It's not hard, right? It's not fun, but it's not hard. All right. So if you do this for the first data set that I made up here, you, unless I made a mistake, you'll find this is um, 0.29, right? So you can kind of look at the data and you can see, ah, oh, there's obviously some clear variability here between the data that are all the same. And so this is a measure of how great that is. So if you look at the second data set, which I also made up, it looks like this, okay? If you calculate the mean, you'll see the mean of this data set is also 1. By construction, I made it so. And then if you calculate the, the variance of this data set using this formula right here, you'll see it's, it's, it's much greater than the first data set. Okay, so the point is that the mean doesn't tell you everything, right? So, um, and in many cases, the variance doesn't tell you everything either. But So the mean doesn't tell you anything about the variability of something. Right? It just tells you if I average all the values together, I get a number. It's the same for both these data sets. Obviously, they're not, they're not all the same. So you can see that they're a lot different from, from looking at the variance. So this variance is going to play a key role in what we do because um, this gives us some measure of the, the variability of the data set. It has something to do with the probability of getting certain values, as we'll see. And so we'll use that a lot. Maybe I'll stay here. Okay, this is really simple. I assume everyone's put the histogram together. I'll show you later how to do this in MATLAB. Very simple to do. So what do we do? We do a bunch of experiments. The, the one problem with these MATLAB plots is the scales are always really small, and I apologize for that. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing a bunch of measurements of X. I think this is 100 different measurements I did, just for a toy example. And then I'm plotting how, what is the occurrence of a particular value of X, okay? So, for example, this is, this is a bar type graph, right? So all the values between 0 and 1 go in this region. All values between 1 and 2 go in that region, so on and so forth. So it gives you some idea of what the, a large data set looks like. Okay? So if you had a data set that looked like this, you would, what would you presume here? Well, you'd see, first of all, there's a lot of variability, right? And you'd kind of see it's not any more likely it'll get one value than any other value. It do definitely doesn't look like that, right? So you, hopefully you can appreciate, if you collect enough values here, like if you start to do you know, 10 experiments, 100 experiments, 1,000 experiments, you'll start to get something that might look like that if the data actually followed that, right? So you know, if you ask yourself a question, which we will ask at some point, does my data look like it comes from something like that? then in principle you could do many, many experiments and then as you collect more and more samples, if it does come from that, it'll start to look like that. I can tell you right now, that's never going to look like that <laughs> for this data set, but okay. So I'll show you um, how you go about doing that. All right. Um, so I don't even remember this example, but I guess I put it together for fun. So what did I do here? I took, um, so Actually, I did. In this case, I used a function in MATLAB, which you don't know, but I'll teach you. And I did a kind of computational experiment. So I collected samples on the computer, not be an experiment, from a distribution that looks like this. I'll show you how to do this in MATLAB. So I actually know that 
I'm taking samples from here. So what does this mean when I do this? And I'll show you how to do this. It's my, m the most likely thing is I'll get an x value here, but I'll get ve x values spread all over, right? And so I happen to know that my particular sample, the samples I'm collecting, comes from a distribution where the mean is actually zero and the variance is actually one, okay? So what I've done here is I've, I've collected 25 random samples. I do this all with the statistic tools in MATLAB. I'm just trying to prove a point right now. So I do 25 random samples from something that looks like that, and I plot this in a histogram. And so from this histogram, if I asked you, does it look like this data comes from something like that? I'd be like, um, I'm not very confident <laughs> it does, right? And you can see from this data, so again, this is the number of occurrences of each value. You can calculate the mean and the variance in the same way. And this shows you the value of having more samples. So if now I increase the number of samples by a factor of 10. I get a histogram that looks like this. Obviously, I get a lot more occurrences. And then if I asked you, does that look like that? You'll say it, it kind of does now, right? I'm starting to look like that. If you calculate the mean and the variance, you'll find from this data set that I collected, um, <coughs> You get a mean of almost zero and a variance almost one. So the idea is that the more and more samples you collect, the more and more accurate your statistical analysis will be, the better it will be, right? The reason you don't take 250 samples usually is because sampling is expensive because real sampling means experiments, right? And you can't just measure everything at all times, okay? Um, so I thought I had one more thing to say about this. I guess not. So this, so you have to appreciate that um, He's going to go get the AV guy? Yeah, all right. Um, hopefully you can appreciate the fact that the more samples we're able to do, the better, right? So the only penalty being that sampling is not free to do. <coughs> okay. So these are some definitions um, that we're going to use. It's just nomenclature, but you have to be familiar with it. So, um, okay, an experiment. We know what that means. So, definition process of taking a measurement or observing a value of something, okay? Sometimes people will call it an observation. A trial means you performed one experiment. So if I say I conducted 10 trials, it, so it means I conducted 10 experiments. The outcome is the result, okay, of the experiment. Usually it's, we call it the sample. It's the value X that I just showed you, the value collect from the experiment. Sample size is the number of experiments or trials performed. We usually give that the name little n, okay? Sample space means a set of all possible outcomes, okay? So the book is big on gambling, as far as I can tell, because most of the, most of the examples are for dice, you know? So not that we roll dice, or at least I'm hoping we don't spend a lot of time rolling dice. Um, so there's six possible outcomes, right? You roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six. That's, that's the possible outcomes. The sample space is all things that could possibly occur, right? which means you either roll one, two, three, four, five, or six, okay? Um, and events, again, are a subset of the sample space. So one event would be you roll a one. A set, another event would be you roll a two, you roll a three, and so on and so forth, okay? So the key idea of underlying probability theory and pretty much everything we're going to do is that every time we take a sample, every time we do an experiment, okay, you're getting a value of some variable, but this variable has some randomness. So for example, I, should, I remember the point I wanted to tell you. Okay, you see these pictures here? If I were to do this computational exercise over again, I'd get different answers every time. Okay? I mean, this, would, this wouldn't vary much because I have so many samples, right? But if I did 25 random samples again, it would be a give it a different mean and a different variance. Every time I do it, you get a different answer. Okay? Um, and so... The way to think about doing an experiment is you have some random variable, some, some variable that's subject to randomness that we're calling x at this point, and uh, each experiment represents one value of that. So the more samples you take, the more you can characterize the, the variability of that sample. Okay, so this is just, this um, gives you some meat for these de different definitions. So this is an example I like, I don't know why it's, if you notice the book, the book um, is not for chemical engineers, right? The book is an, a, a book on applied mathematics. It has problems from all different engineering disciplines. So I try to make sure all the examples I have are related to, you know, chemical engineering or materials or something at least related to chemical engineering. So I made a little example here of going through these definitions. So 
Everyone knows what a polymer is. I think we talked about that time. So oftentimes you want to make thin films of these for different applications. So for example, for solar cells, you might want to make a thin film to collect energy from the sun, okay? And so a critical property, not surprising, of a thin film is its thickness, <laughs> right? How thick is the film? 100 microns, whatever it might be. And so a trial would mean you take one of these thin films and you measure its thickness, okay? So you perform one experiment, take one film, somehow measure its thickness, okay? That would be a trial, an experiment. The outcome would be what is the measured value for that, the X value, we'll call it. Okay, sample size is the number of samples that you want to measure. Okay, so a common problem if you're going to make thin or anything for that matter is if you make a bunch of, um, let's say you make thin films. That's a good example since we're talking about that. So how does this work? You understand that in the in industry, if you're making these thin films, you're selling them to someone. Someone wants some guarantee that they're good. Right, this don't take any crap you happen to give them, okay? That means you have to do some testing. You have to test these thin films before you ship them so that they, that they know they're good. Let's say they want 10,000 thin films. You can't measure 10,000 thin films one by one and say that every one, you know, here are all the good ones. We threw all the bad ones away. So you might measure like, you know, 20 of them and then make a decision, are they all good or all bad based on 20, okay? If they're all good, you ship them all 10,000. If they're all bad, you throw all 10,000 away if you think they're all bad, okay? So a key thing here is the sample size um, is usually for a problem like this gonna be much smaller than the total number of things you could possibly sample, okay? So again, making 10,000, sampling 20 or something like this, okay? Um, so I, I, I made up this myself, okay? So you'd have to quantify this a little bit, but you can imagine there's, there's three possibilities. One is that the, the film thickness is good. It's, it's, it's got to be within some tolerance, right? They can't tell you, make it 100 microns exactly. They might say, make it 105 to, you know, 95 to 105 microns. That's good. So if it's in that range, you consider that sample acceptable. If it's too thin, it's too thin. Otherwise, it's too thick. So there's three possibilities, okay? Um, and so, right, when you do an experiment, there's three events you could have, right? You, you either like it or you don't like it because it's too thin or you don't like it because it's too thick. Um, and again, the key thing is here, how are we going to extract something about, because you can imagine if you make thin films, you might get something like this, right? This is the thin film thickness. This is the probability of it having a certain thickness, right? And you are trying, and so what, what's going to happen if you manufacture something like this? Th the people that you sell the material to are going to say, we need some average thickness and some variability. Like, you got to give us the right average within some tolerance, and the variability has to be within some range. If it's more variable than that, we don't want it, okay? So the thing we're going to have to learn, or we're going to learn how to do, is how to make a decision of that based on a small number of samples, because that's really the, that's the real world. And hopefully, you can uh, appreciate this concept. If I make 10,000 films, and I want to judge whether all 10,000 are okay based on 20 samples, I can't be sure. <laughs> cannot be 100% sure of this, okay? So I'm going to have to set a tolerance. Like, I'm 95% sure that these samples are good, right? And that's the best I can do. If I want 100% guarantee, then I have to measure every one. So I'm going to have to set some probability limits to whether I think they're okay or not. All right. Okay, well, this is just set theory, which I bet you... Every time I teach something like this, I'm always convinced I saw this in third grade, but that's probably not true, is it? They probably weren't teaching set theory to me in third grade. I'm so old, I can't differentiate third grade, 12th grade, graduate school. All right. Um, all right, so I told you that the sample space is divided into certain events. This is all possible things that can happen from an experiment, right? Too thin, okay, too thick, one, two, three, four, five, six, heads, tails, whatever you might like. Um, so everyone, I hope, knows what the union and interse uh, intersection of two sets are, right? So this symbol means the um, union. That means all points that are either in set A, set B, sorry, set one, set two, or both. It can be in both sets, that's fine. The intersection is what points are in both sets, okay? So for many of the problems that we might be interested in, the intersection tends to be empty, right? Because if someone said, what's the probability I roll a one and a two at the same time? 
the answer is, well, that doesn't happen, right? So there's no intersection between those two sets. Those kind of sets are called disjoint, yeah, disjoint sets, okay? So the idea here is the sample set, what can possibly happen is just the union of all the particular events that might happen, right? So, right, if you want to make a thin film, what might happen, what's all the possibilities is too thin, okay, too thick, something like this, okay? So if um, the two sets are disjoint, meaning they have no intersection, that's what the definition of disjoint, it means these two sets have no common el common um, commonality. So this zero, if you're not familiar with this, means the zero set, the empty set. It's not the zero number, it means set doesn't have any, is, is an empty set, okay? And then this is actually important here, we use this concept a fair amount. So if of a complement of a set. So if I have some event A1, the complement of A1, which has this notation here, means everything else that might happen, okay? So if I asked you, if I said A1 is, hi. Person, do we leave the microphone? You, you want the mic? Sure, let's see if we can get it working. All right, I'll just hand it over to you. All right. Okay, so if A1 here, for example, is the, the thin film having the right thickness, the complement is everything that else that might happen. In other words, that would be too thin and too thick. Okay? <laughs> he likes that. Oh, did, was there, are you laughing at my lecture or are you laughing at my AV capabilities? Testing. Testing. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. This guy is uh, actually paid a substantial amount to help. <laughs> Power. Okay. okay. I'd rather have you laugh at that than laugh about compliment sets. If you actually were laughing about that, I'd have some serious concerns about you. Because <laughs> it's really not all that funny. All right. <laughs> we'll discuss that later. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, right. So, so this idea of a compliment set is important. Um, because sometimes it's, if you, you want to know what's the probability of something occurring, call it A1, but it's much easier to calculate what's the probability of it, so, that it not occurring, okay? That's the reason this is useful. So, for example, it might be easier to calculate when the thin film is not okay than when it is. I don't know why that would be the case, but let's just pretend, okay? So the idea is that, all this says here is that the union of something happening and everything but that happening is everything that could happen, <laughs> right? So that's a little perverse language, but so the probability, so if you took the, the event of it having the right thickness and took the union of that with it not having the right thickness, which means it's too thin or too thick, the union of those two things is everything that can possibly happen. It's kind of, kind of obvious. And by definition of the complement set, the union of a set with its complement is empty, right? Because the complement is everything other than it, than it itself, so the union has to be the empty set, okay? Oh, I'm coming back to my thin film. Okay, we have three possible events, right? Too thin, acceptable, too thick. I've already done all this, right? The union of those three things is the sample space. In other words, that's all possibilities that, that might occur, okay? These events have no intersection. You can't be too thick and too thin at the same time. You can't be too thick and acceptable, yeah? I, uh, yeah, this, this, yeah, so this is union, that's intersection. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Don't, don't listen to what I say, listen to what I show, okay? I'm just kidding. Um, right, okay, so I said these, they're disjoint, and then each event is the complement of the other two events, which I already told you. Okay. All right, this looks a little hairy. It's not so bad. So, um, this is a definition, not really a very formal definition, but good enough for our purposes, of what we mean by probability, okay? So this says, this is the definition of probability for finitely, that means there's a finite number of things that can happen, right? Like rolling a dice, there's only six possibilities, right? If someone said, what's the, what's the, like if you're measuring temperature, there's an infinite number of things that could happen, right? It's a real number, first of all, <laughs> okay? So I'm, not, I'm talking about, so finitely many things that can happen, they're all equally likely, okay? Which means we're not, we're not biased um, to do one thing or the other, 
So in the book, they call this fair dice. It means like if you roll dice, it's equally likely you'll get any of the numbers, right? It's not biased in any way, equally likely, okay? So the definition is the number of points in this set divided by the total number of points in the entire space, sample space, or let me get my notation. Yeah, sample space, yeah. Okay, so the probability of you having event AJ, call it A1, is the number of points in AJ relative to the number of points in the entire sample space of all things that might happen, okay? What's the probability that you'll get a point in the sample space? One, by definition, because the sample space is everything that could happen. So the probability it w something will happen in that space is guaranteed to be one, okay? We're often interested um, in this type of thing, okay? So if, if you wanted to know the, um, so you're going to see a lot of this in statistics. You're going to see um, kind of a theoretical definition, right? And then you're going to see a definition based on the number of samples, okay? So you, you can see this, this looks a lot like this in a way, okay? But this is the true probability. This would be some measure of what we think the probability is from a certain number of samples, okay? They're not the same. You're only going to get the real probability if the number of samples goes to infinity. Does that make sense to you? Okay. There's some, tr there's some reality <laughs> underlying the system that we're studying. We'll get closer and closer to the reality if we get an infinite number of samples. So you'll see this a lot. This will be the true probability, and this is, in a sense, our estimate of what the probability is. Okay. So we do a number of experiments. I hate to bring up the dice thing because actually it's, it's not a good example for you guys, <laughs> but um, if you were to roll a dice, if, if someone said, I want to know what the probability, because someone's not very smart, let's say, and they say, I want to know what the probability of rolling a one is, right? And so you roll it 10 times and you're like, it never happened, it's impossible, right? <laughs> um, that's not a good <laughs> statistical analysis, obviously. But I'd, if you wanted to um, roll the dice you know, a thousand times, ten thousand times, a hundred thousand times, hope you'd appreciate that the probability of rolling a one would be getting increasingly close to one-sixth, right? It wouldn't actually be guaranteed to get to one-sixth until you roll an infinite number of times, okay? So this is a reasonable thing. You do a set of experiments, n of them, you see how many times the thing you're interested in occurs and divide it by the total number of experiments you did, and that's your best estimate of the probability of it occurring, unless you want to do more experiments, right? Does that make sense? So it's guaranteed that this number is between 0 and 1 because there's no way for this to occur more than the number of experiments you've performed, okay? You calculate this, it's just like this. What's the probability of it being something... Okay, you're rolling a dice. What's the probability of it being a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6? 1. Doesn't matter how many experiments you do. That's the only thing that can possibly happen, okay? If you ask yourself this, so if uh, this is for disjoint events, that means you cannot have, for example, A1 and A2 occurring at the same time, okay? It's like flipping a coin. What's the probability I flip a coin and get heads and tails? Uh, zero, okay? What's the probability I get heads or tails? Well, it's the probability you get heads plus the probability you get tails, just add them together, right? This becomes important because sometimes you might, you, you'll see this in a, in a moment in an example. You, you have to include this to avoid sometimes double counting things if they're not disjoint sets. Okay, and then we have this various so-called axioms of probability, okay? Um, so the probability also ha has to always be between zero and one. That's what we mean by probability. The probability of the set itself, the sample space, has to be one. The probability of the intersection of these events occurring is nothing but the 